Hello and welcome to episode 72 of the Page One Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And thanks for joining us at the Page One Podcast, where we like to talk to writers of all kinds about their writing careers, how they got into the industry and try and get as many hints and tips from them as possible. And we've had, uh, as I say, uh, all sorts of different writers, authors, screenwriters, comic writers, uh, video game writers. And this week's guest is a very exciting one who, who crosses a couple of those boundaries. Absolutely. This week we're chatting with none other than Mr. David Nichols, who um, personally, I always saw him as a, a big novel writer, you know, started for 10, Us, One Day, those those books, but he's actually had a really varied career um, and, and, and books weren't where, where he first started from either. No, and, and in fact, he, he, he didn't even start writing. He, he was He was an actor <laughs> to begin with and then moved into screenwriting and it you know it's a fascinating uh, the path that he took uh, into that as well so he knew a director and he he ended up they ended up adapting a Sam Shepard play into a movie script that then got made um, and then that got him his job on Cold Feet uh, the the um the really successful ITV program um and then from there uh, the screenwriting sort of took a dip and that's when he moved into novels and those novels were massive hits obviously and then he began adapting both his own novels and other people's novels into screenwriting so you know he's had a really interesting and varied career uh, yep. so far in in terms of his writing and it was just really interesting to chat with him about you know how these things you know how that path has been forged and as ever with all our guests you know it's never it's never what you expect, I think. No, I think that's absolutely right. And, and he's certainly got an interesting way in and and a, a kind of circular path where he's kind of gone back to the screenwriting that he obviously enjoyed at, at, at the start and he's making more of a splash than that now. And it's, it's a really nice chat. He's a, uh, he's a lovely guy and it was, it's a really fun, fun uh, conversation, I think. It's great fun. And I, I, yeah, as you say, it really fascinating really to, to hear someone who is at the top of their game in both novel writing and screenwriting and just to hear how they approach both of those things is always interesting um yeah. you know there is there are definitely differences between the two crafts and we chat about that and what those differences are and why you know there are there are pros and cons to each form of writing i think absolutely but that's enough from us Let's jump on with the podcast and see what he has to say. Yeah, so we'll just play a quick advert for our writer's notebook and then we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat and to let you know about next week's guest. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made Page One. Page One is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. 
We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. I think you came to writing via acting, is, is that right? Yeah, though I think looking back, I think acting was a kind of writing substitute, really. I didn't know anyone who worked in the arts or entertainment or who'd been to university. The whole business of, of the creative industries was something that I was simultaneously fascinated by and completely excluded from. You know, I, I didn't really, it would have felt, felt very strange to say, uh, I want to be a writer, mm -hmm. very presumptuous. I didn't really understand how the whole thing worked. It must have been like being a pop star or something. So um, for me, the, the benefit of acting was that it kind of gave you access to the whole business of story and characters and dialogue. You know, I was a TV kid. I just grew up watching hours and hours and hours of television. Mm. I never went to the theatre at all. So I, it wasn't that I had this great love of the stage. I just... I just liked watching telly and I liked reading books. I just I found it really exciting. You know, I was completely fixated on, on drama and comedy. Mm -hmm. And um, acting was the only way into that. So I never really, it was never, when you, when you meet an actor who's completely monomaniacal about it, obsessed with it, it's the only thing they ever want to do. That, that, that isn't me. I, I, I am. Um, I just liked words, stories, characters, jokes. Mm -hmm. And at school, certainly that was the only way in. So I didn't know what I'd write, you know. I, I, I didn't have any sense of something I, I wanted or needed to say beyond you know, the stories I tell at parties and my own experience. I, I, I didn't um, have a particular genre that I felt I could... I could um, I had a grasp of, you know, I was I was very eclectic in my tastes. I loved horror and science fiction and sitcom and soap opera and 19th century literature and Shakespeare and black and white films. And I, I, I just sort of loved everything. Mm -hmm. And um, acting gave me a small taste of that world. And so what was it then that, that led you to try your hand? At, I think it was a screenplay at, at first. What, what made you yeah. make that decision? Uh, when I went to university, uh, I, I started doing, this was the late 80s, which was a kind of golden era of comedy, particularly stand-up comedy and sketch comedy. Uh, you know, I'd grown up on Monty Python, and now there were the young ones, and all kinds of exciting new TV comedy genres that I was really interested in. And I, I, I had this vague notion that I wanted to do sketch comedy. Uh, I love that kind of review tradition, mm -hmm. that kind of beyond the fringe tradition. So I used to do skits and sketches at parties with my friend Matthew Warchus at university. And that was, I suppose, the first thing that I wrote, little kind of bits of stand-up and sketch writing. And then after university, I didn't really know how to pursue that. Um, I wanted to, you know, maybe try it out professionally, but Matthew was a brilliant theatre director and he went off to do that. And I had this terrible realisation that, that I was I wasn't the funny one, let's put it like that. <laughs> so that was a kind of dead end. I went to America to study acting. And while I was there, I used to write letters to friends. And I had a, a very basic early word processor called a Canon Star Writer, uh, which could do this miraculous thing of of memorizing text. You know, you could you could write a page and and it would remember it, which seemed extraordinary in 1989 which meant that you could edit it. And I, I began to write letters to friends and, and to put quite a lot of work into them to make them uh, full of you know comedy and detail. And I would send these to people. And I, I did that really throughout my 20s. I wrote a lot of letters to friends and, and the response was always great. The response was always, you know, these have stories, they have characters in there, dialogue. Why don't you write? And I was not a great actor. You know, I've made a lot of, I've made it, it turned this into a bit of a, a shtick but I wasn't really talented in any way on stage uh, and a lot of people said you're doing the wrong part of this job you should be writing but again I didn't really know what to write the only thing that had ever happened to me was going to university and being an actor and both of those things were kind of not necessarily commercially viable or 
things that the general public were interested in. I felt a bit intimidated. I wrote a certain amount of of of, of um, terrible poetry, but I was sort of bullied into actually sitting down to write by Matthew, the same friend I used to do stand up with. He he was having a huge success as a stage director, and I was having no success at all as a stage actor. But he wanted to turn a Sam Shepard play called Sympatico into a movie. And by this stage, I was working part time as a script reader, reading lots of unsolicited manuscripts um, for theatre companies and TV and film companies. And so I had a basic knowledge of what a script should look like. Mm -hmm. um, I was writing what well, they could, you know, coverage. I was writing coverage. And um, because I'd read you know, more than one film script. He thought that I might know a little bit about how to adapt a play for the screen. So my very first completed script was um, was an adaptation of a Sam Shepard play. We, oh, cool. we had a meeting with Sam Shepard, which was oh, wow. for both of us a huge thrill because we, we'd we both been obsessed with True West at university. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were kind of Sam Shepard groupies and he, he wouldn't fly, but he was in London, um, because Jessica Lang was in the West End and had come over on the QE2, and we had a very nervous meeting with him, and he gave us his blessing to write this film script about a, a horse racing scam in California in the 70s, which was nothing to do with our lives or experience. But we, <laughs> over the course of a few years, we worked on this screenplay, and at the same time, I also began writing uh, a comedy script you know I'd always been into sitcom and I was writing, trying to write a comedy script about my own experience as a kind of unemployed actor working in restaurants it was a sitcom about a group of uh, waiters who want to do other things called waiting and another friend of mine was bullying me into writing that so I, I had this pressure from a very for a small group of friends who thought that if I could find a discipline to sit down and and and, and actually type things out that people would be prepared to read them, which was something that I could never quite believe. And uh, between this rather uh, flip and silly sitcom and this rather somber and uncommercial Hollywood movie, I had two script projects on the go. Mm. And, and those really were my passport into, into writing. The sitcom scripts got me onto a course run by what used to be Carlton Television, uh, for which I wrote my second sitcom script. And uh, I got paid a tiny amount for both. You know, I got paid £300 from Jeffrey Perkins at the BBC for my sitcom about waiters. And I got paid a couple of hundred quid for the sitcom. Another sitcom I wrote, which was about a, a, a kind of down at heel variety club. And amazingly, purely because of Matthew's talent and ambition, the Sam Shepard film got made. So all of a sudden I had my name on a, not a Hollywood film, but a film that starred Jeff Bridges and Sharon Stone <laughs> and Albert Finney and Catherine Keener and I had my name on it. That's fantastic. Uh, which was a, an amazing break, but also a bit of a dead end because I didn't know about, I, I didn't want a career writing Hollywood movies. I, I couldn't write naturally in an American vernacular. I was, I was really piggybacking on um, Matthew's drive and ambition but even though the film didn't really do anything it sort of slipped away I, it was a good piece of work and it meant that I had these three very eclectic um calling cards and how did the just going back to it did you have an agent at that time or how did you get these scripts and was it through Matthew that that obviously simpatico the that that project got done but how did you get the script for example the waiting script to the bbc was that through an uh, agent or did you just submit no, it or? i was i i was you know the, the, the terrible truth is it's it sort of is who you know mm -hmm. i i'd met uh a, 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 a very good friend of mine at university was a uh became a bbc tv producer a woman called claudia lloyd who was wonderful and, and was always pushing me to write 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 and she she um i uh, she got the script to jeffrey perkins right okay. and we had a we had a little meeting and uh yeah as i say we did a rehearsed reading very nearly got green lit um so i was i'm very grateful to you know to claudia and to matthew and to jeffrey perkins and to all these people who gave me a little leg up to begin with even though all of it was sort of a bit of a dead end really because um um 
I I wasn't really writing in a in my own voice. I wasn't really mm. writing what I what I wanted to. And none of this was really providing me with a living. I didn't have an agent until Simpatico was actually out in the cinemas. And then Matthew's agent took me on. Uh, uh, an agent called uh, Alan Radcliffe, who was a wonderful agent, but he, he phoned me up soon after and said, um, David, we need to have a talk. I've got some big news. And uh, he was such a great agent. I, I didn't want to lose him. I thought, am I being fired? He said, um, the fact is, you're about to hear about this um, from someone else. So I thought I'd just tell you now. My son is about to be Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to be your agent anymore. And um, that's what happened. I lost uh, I lost Alan because of uh, because Daniel went on to be Harry Potter. Wow. That was a, little, <laughs> a couple of years later. That's crazy. Um, More world. But um, Alan was my first agent and he took a gamble on me and he was he was a great agent. He got me uh, meeting producers and uh, and yet I was still working as a script editor. At this stage, I, I, I'd, I'd stopped reading um, screenplays as a freelancer and I'd got a job at BBC Radio Drama reading The Slush Pile, developing various things, reading books for adaptation. And uh, that led to a job in television script editing at uh, LWT. Um, and there I was responsible for finding new ideas for kind of Sunday night, ITV, nine o'clock, eight o'clock, big mainstream dramas, pitching ideas. And I had this idea to do something about national service. At this stage, uh, the, the big, um, the kind of holy grail of television drama was the precinct drama, mm -hmm. where you'd, you know, you'd have an ensemble and it would be, you know, a fire station in Cornwall in the 50s or, uh, or you know, and, and a contained world, an ensemble cast, the story of the week, a kind of slow burn, will they, won't they love story. You know, there was, it was a very solid um traditional form of drama that was kind of everywhere in in the mm. late 90s and i had this idea to do something about national service because it hadn't really been done for a long time and it was a fascinating world and you could get a really eclectic young cast together there was lots of potential for storylines for, 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 for love stories and thriller stories and it was a good idea and um I pitched it to uh, my heads of department uh, and they said, uh, this is great. You know, we'd love to take this to television center. Who, who do you want to write it? And I took a deep breath and I said, well, you know, I've written this film. I've written these two sitcoms. I think I could write this. And very kindly, Sally and Gwenda did let me write the first draft. And, and that was my first one hour drama. So now I had four scripts. I had it. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure about adaptation, two sitcoms, and a, a, a classic, you know, ITV, um, forty-eight minute drama, and this got me a meeting with Christine Langen, who was um, at that stage having a great success with Cold Feet, and that was my that was my breakthrough, really working on Cold Feet with Christine. I I I, I joined the show uh, for the third series at a time when it was becoming um, the idea was that it would be a, a, a writer's room mm. um, all through that period of time I think we'd all seen the same documentaries and writer's rooms were the, the way forward so I joined the writer's room for Cold Feet and ended up writing four episodes of that and uh, that was my big break and, and does the writer's room is it the same idea that I have in my head for a US show where it's kind of everyone around the big table pitching ideas and some folk are getting left behind and other folk are getting pulled together and it's, it kind of becomes a big amalgamation of everyone's thoughts. Yeah. I mean, it was very much Mike Bullen's show. You know, he'd, he'd had, you know, written some wonderful episodes for the first two series. And I think he was just exhausted at the prospect of writing all eight by himself. So he was going to write two. And then there was a whole group of writers who were going to, to write alongside him. And in the end, everyone got sacked, including me. I, I was sacked for a while and managed to get myself back onto it thanks to Christine. But um it was a very, very hard show to 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 get right. You know, the mixture of comedy and drama was very tricky. Mm. You had to get all of these six uh characters' voices. Um it was it was really 
a, a kind of baptism of fire. And I think we all love the idea because, as I say, you know, that we'd seen all these American documentaries about pitching storylines and pinning bits of card to the wall and all of that. And yet it didn't quite work. I think for British writers, it's it's very hard to have that very thick skin Mm -hmm. and to have someone throw out your storyline or throw out your scene or punch up your comedy you know we're quite i certainly felt quite possessive of it and um yeah it was a sort of um it was like a kind of agatha christie week by week people would drop off and many of those writers have gone on to have great success by themselves but i think we all found the writer's room experience quite demanding um I, I was just going to say uh, that um, we were we were speaking to Peter Moffat uh, uh, a, a few days ago, and he actually he was talking about the writers' room as well. And in America, it, you know, there were people in the writers' room that had worked in a writers' room for years that hadn't seen one line of their dialogue on on screen, but they oh, still, yeah. you know, that was their job. It's a, it's just the it's a very odd concept when you when you think that you want to be a writer, but you've not had anything actually appear on the screen. No, I, I mean, it, I think culturally, maybe it doesn't really fit. I, succession, the succession writers room obviously works beautifully, mm-hmm. though, you know, I think that the, the, the idea that your name is on the episode and therefore you wrote the episode is, isn't necessarily the case. I think perhaps the distinction is that, um, you know, British television drama and comedy, it's all about distinctive individual voices mm-hmm. and, and writers uh, kind of lead the way you know we, we all even if you don't particularly even if you're not nerdy about it you know Jack Rosenthal and, and, and you know, Alan Bleasdale you know you kind of grow up with these names yeah. they're just there um, and Jimmy McGovern you know I, I, I think much more than directors um, writers have a kind of um, currency in British television and uh, a singular voice you know you hear that phrase a lot and so maybe the, the 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 business of the writers' room, where you're really serving the show, the format, um, doesn't quite fit with us. Uh, though there have been exceptions. So um, you know, it just so happened that I I could just about pull off the cold feet voice. You know, I could do serious scenes and pathos, and I could write comic set pieces, and I I had a handle on the structure of the thing, where you have a main storyline and a a secondary storyline that kind of complements it and weaves in and out and a, a third jokier storyline and that you have to hit these particular um, high points just in time for the ad breaks. And, you know, I, I could sort of do it. Um, there was a bit of trial and error, but I could pull it off. And um, that led me to get more commissions, which were purely my own. And and when was it that you decided, I want to try my hand at writing a novel? Was it, was it, after that, was it kind of something that had always been in your mind or was it your experience in the writer's room and that kind of feeling of, I want to write something that's purely my own? No, it was, I mean, it, I, I, it was, it was, it came out of pure disaster, really. I, I, um, I, after Cold Feet, I had two green lights very quickly. One was for a, a, a kind of romantic comedy miniseries for Faye called um, I Saw You, Faye Ripley, because I'd love writing for Faye and Cold Feet and it was a sort of little spin-off for her, um, the idea was to try and, yeah, try and do a screwball comedy, a kind of romantic comedy at nine o'clock. Romantic comedy is really hard to do on television because it's, you know, it's so finite. It's such a, it's such a hard thing to sustain. But we built this little world around her and worked out who her character was. And it was about, um, you know, various men that she met and who she was going to choose. It was a sort of, you know, far from the madding crowd premise you've got it you go for the posh guide you go for the nice reliable guide you go for the sexy guy and it was it was um it was fun and i was really proud of it it's called i saw you uh it came from a pilot which was based around the idea of those i saw you columns in listings yeah. magazines where mm-hmm. people have a chance encounter and the, the yeah. original the original gag was that someone writes an i saw you ad because they fall in love with someone on the bus and the wrong person turns up <laughs> that was the that was the, That's the, the like that, yeah yeah which was really good and and uh but it was very hard to spin off into more than one episode and so um it happened and i really loved it but it was you know i was finding my way and at the same time i got the green light for a show on bbc one called uh rescue me which was another idea i'd had to do something about initially it was about a kind of 
it's a very 90s idea, a kind of um, men's magazine office next to a women's magazine office. So it's sort of, it was sort of GQ versus Cosmo, and it was going to be a kind of lighthearted battle of the sexes thing between these two magazine offices. And then it goes for various drafts. It, it turned into something rather more somber about loneliness and divorce. And, and um, this was around the time of Sex in the City. And so Sex in the City was all bright and outrageous and, and, and wild. And this show we were working on was rather melancholic and, and sad and about loneliness and unrequited love and cities being terrible places. and magazines being quite um uh maybe not the most positive uh world um to work in and and so it was it was it was a good show with a wonderful cast um sally phillips played the lead and i was again really proud of it but it didn't really catch on it was very metropolitan which was the, the big worry of the bbc you know it was all about london wine bars and so uh I, the, both of these shows went out at the same time. Uh, I saw you was on Friday night and um, Rescue Me was on Sunday, uh, on uh, one on ITV1, one on BBC, which is sort of unheard of really. And uh, as the weeks went by and the viewing figures went down, I went from being this very hot TV writer with a show on both channels at nine o'clock to, to someone whose career was pretty much over. Uh, so, <laughs> I remember going to a BBC writers' party and people were coming up to me and just kind of putting their hand on my back. Are you okay? Are you all right? <laughs> um, and uh, I didn't. I, we we thought that Rescue Me might get a second series, and I started planning it, but um, it didn't. And so suddenly, I had nothing to do. I, I had gone from being, you know, as I say, someone who was had a, a you know had pulled off this great coup of having two show, shows on at the same time to someone who really couldn't get any work. Um, which isn't to say that I, I don't think both shows were, were, were really good. I was very proud of them, but they just didn't take off. Uh, everyone was looking for the new Cold Feet and neither of these shows were the new Cold Feet. So um, I had to find something else to do and I had this idea to write about, um, you know, going to university was a very big deal for me and it was a strange world. I wasn't expecting to go and uh, I, I made all kinds of terrible faux pas and made it fool myself, but I also really loved it. And I wanted to write about that. But university was a bit of a no-no for TV commissioners. You know, it was, um, again, thought to be too middle class and snooty and the stakes could never possibly be high enough. And um, so I knew that I couldn't get a, a university TV show away. In fact, I tried when I was a script editor and every commissioning editor said no. British people hate students, and it won't it won't work. So I started to write what I thought might be a you know a kind of a monologue, a, a um, one person show or something, and just started to sketch it out. And the difficulty with something like university as a subject is that it can just be a lot of anecdotes. You know, it can just be mm -hmm. kind of a, a lot of little funny things that happen to you. But I I was watching. University challenge one night and saw you know this this um, this team that was um, a kind of mix of sort of geeks and glamour and I thought that's funny why don't we do it around why don't we do a kind of sports movie but the sport is university challenge yeah. and that was um, the idea for start of a ten and I wrote about ten thousand words and uh, uh, not the beginning of the novel the middle section. A kind of self-contained set piece about going to stay uh, with um, with the family of the girl he's fallen in love with and it all going wrong and um, showed it to a friend who's the script editor and I said don't show this to anyone and she showed it to someone she showed it to a, a book agent Johnny Geller and and it was good you know it was a good piece of hmm. comic prose and it got picked up and so I could walk away from television for a while and 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 work on uh fiction very much finding my way you know i i i, I wrote my book editor um got a 30 page plot synopsis because that's what you had to do for cold yeah. you had to write you know a scene breakdown 
And she'd never really seen this before because you didn't do that with fiction. You know, you just wrote the book. And, she, you know, I, I said, well, you know, do you have any notes? And she said, well, no, not really. You're the author, just write it. And so immediately I came face to face with this huge difference between yeah. uh, yeah. fiction editing and and uh, television editing, which isn't to say that books aren't edited, but they're edited after they've been written. Mm-hmm. Whereas with uh, scripts, you have every line of dialogue, every scene is scrutinized before it gets anywhere near uh, the set. So um, that was a, that was something of a shock to me, but a great pleasure as well. And I was, I was going to ask about that, actually. But, you know, the similarities or dissimilarities between uh, sort of producer's notes and the editor's notes uh, in, in the two different formats. I mean, are, are they similar or... You know, no. with, with yeah, I was going to say with movies. Obviously, are there more people putting their putting their notes into you essentially? Yeah, I, I think also you know uh, the the bottom line is it's about money. You know, the, mm-hmm. it doesn't cost. There's no major difference between a three hundred twenty page novel and a three hundred thirty page novel. Yeah, I mean there are there mar- you know, minimal cost differences, but um, on screen everything needs to be there for a reason you know every scene needs to move things forward it has to show you something that hasn't been uh seen before um, which is why when i read a novel i often think in terms of i i'm always sitting there with a novel thinking oh, we know this about the character or, we've had this scene or we've had this story beat or yes you've established this point move things on because i'm reading fiction like i i do yeah. a, a script where where really you want to cut everything that yeah. isn't 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 useful. Well, it's crazy to think of fiction like that. Fiction doesn't have to be like that at all. It, it can it can go off on tangents and it can be anecdotal and it can be discursive and it can be descriptive because it's a different medium. Whereas with a screenplay, everything is going to get looked at. And um, I will, if I write a page of dialogue in a novel, I will revise it myself, but I will get very few notes on that. In a screenplay, I will get notes, not just from the actors, but from the, the producers and the director as well. You know, is this character's intention clear? Does this joke work? And so I will rewrite a page of dialogue in the script over and over and over again. But in fiction, you kind of get into a zone and it, it flows. And as long as it's flowing for the reader too, you can still polish it, but it won't be rewritten in the same way. When I, um, when I uh, delivered my first draft of the novel, to my really brilliant book editor. She, she, she was very pleased with it, but she said, you do realize you can say what the characters are thinking. And was, this was the huge breakthrough for me, was that you could, you could just say it. You could just say, <laughs> you know, I felt terrible, or, um, or uh, I wish I hadn't said that. You know, it, whereas in a, in a, in a, script because you only have action and dialogue because you only have the exterior the objective behavior of a character you can't go into the, the, the their thoughts and feelings uh, you can't pause the action you know you have to keep moving forwards and so the the ability to to write an inner voice either in the first person or third person was um was the biggest difference for me and that that's a wonderful tool because uh you can particularly for comedy you can have so much fun with the difference between what a character thinks and what they yeah. what they say and do you know if you think of a novel uh, uh think especially comic characters like adrian mole or bridget jones very very hard to adapt those for the screen without without putting on a voiceover mm-hmm. because the interior voice is so different from what they from their behavior yeah. and their dialogue and so that was the big breakthrough for me that you didn't have to constantly be uh you didn't have to hide information you could just state it when yeah. when a character meets another character you can say it's it's his sister you don't have to find ways in the dialogue to reveal yeah. that it's his sister yeah. not his friend mm-hmm. and um there's a kind of directness uh and ease to that in fiction and fiction even the greatest novel isn't great in every paragraph you know there's a certain amount of of forward momentum that carries you through a novel but whereas a script you know when when people say that terrible thing of script meeting let's turn the pages you think oh my god we really are going to turn the pages we're going to go through everything and check mm-hmm. that it's necessary or that it's working mm-hmm. whereas with a novel i will get a note from my editor that will say something like it's getting a bit slow here 
or I feel like I feel like we could pick up the pace. So I wonder if we need to know this much about the uh, inner thoughts of the character at this stage. I'll get general pacing notes, but I won't get that agonizing line by line scrutiny that I get with a screenplay. I mean, it definitely sounds that you enjoy the kind of the more solo aspect of writing books and um, and the, the the fewer notes that you get compared to writing scripts. Is that fair to say? Uh, when you're writing fiction and it's going well and you know what you're doing and you know where you're heading and you feel that the prose is good prose and that you know who the characters are and there are no obstacles in your way, it's bliss. But if you're stuck or if the novel isn't quite working or you, you, you're not you're not adding to it, you're just taking away, it's getting smaller every day, or you have a, a, a niggling notion in the back of your head that the premise is wrong and no one's going to read it, that's awful. And then you you miss the 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 ability you have with a screenplay to mm -hmm. pick up the phone and say, I'm not sure about this scene or uh, this mm -hmm. character isn't really working or I don't believe this ending. You know, there's no one to do that with with fiction. The flip side of that is, you know, I I cannot tell you how much I hate note sessions. I mean, I, I <laughs> not because the people uh, I, I'm working with are unpleasant or are doing anything wrong. It's just that they're torture, you know, because um, I will get my notes on a novel. Largely, I will get them on a document. I, I, the, the manuscript comes back to me in Word and it's got all the amendments and suggestions in the margin and I just go through and I literally tick or cross. I accept mm -hmm. or decline. Or if it says, you know, I think you need to explain this a little more, then I'll add two or three sentences. And if it says, um, not sure we need this, I'll look and I'll take some words out. But I don't have those grinding three, four, five hour meetings where you, you where people say, what if? Because, you know, a, a chance remark like, wouldn't it be great if can take you down a blind alley that will last, yeah. you know, for days or mm. weeks or uh, it's, it's agony. And I think you know, perhaps another reason why the writer's room did work well is there's a kind of bluntness required in, in, in screenwriting, a kind of, you know, this isn't working or you need to throw this out or um uh that's a terrible idea <laughs> you know no one has ever said that to me in a publishing meeting <laughs> but uh in 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 a script meeting sometimes you have to say it sometimes you have to say and no, i don't want to do that that's bad and um so i don't like that aspect of it either i i, I think prose is a more um is less it's, it's more personal also, it's more immersive, it's more emotive for the writer. Um, there's something very structural and technical about screenwriting that's really exciting, but there's a reason why it's referred to as a craft, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of it is about moving, moving the scaffolding around. And um, I, I have been moved while writing a screenplay, but it's not the same as, as the kind of deep mining into your soul that comes from writing a novel and um i and that's why i don't write many novels you know i i i um i don't have uh if, if i i get very jealous of writers novelists who are working in a world or you know working with a recurring character because each of my five novels have been completely different you start from scratch every time and that can be uh exhausting and 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 it's hard to come up with something that you want to live with for two or three or four or five years mm -hmm. you know it's it's whereas with a screenplay there's a certain you have to be pretty it's a very rough and ready document you know you're going to throw things out you're going to move it around you're going to cut jokes you're going to treat it with a certain amount of um not flippancy uh but um it's not a it's not a literary form in itself. It's a instruction mm. document, uh, and um, open to all kinds of interpretations. Whereas the book is the book, and it is is the process that you because of that is the process that you have for writing a screenplay different than from writing a novel. I mean, you said for starter for ten, you sort of did the the treatment, the sort of scene by scene breakdown, is that something you would still do for a novel? Would you plan it in that much detail or 
it, have it you moved away that, from that? Yeah, I don't, I don't quite so do it quite so formally. I mean, I did it because I thought they'd want it, and they didn't. <laughs> you know, I hate writing, I hate writing synopses or treatments. They're just the worst thing in the world. They're horrible. Mm -hmm. But um, it once I'd, once I had it, it was a wonderful thing to have because I stuck to it very, very closely. Uh, it depends on the, the novel, really. With one day, that was a kind of jigsaw puzzle. So I had to really know where everyone was on with, on on each particular day and and where they were in between the chapters as well. And so that was planned. But my last novel, Sweet Sorrow, which is uh, a kind of summer love story, um, it's not really plot led. It's much more um, to do with uh, a mood and memory and relationships and nostalgia. And that was written in a much more informal way. That was, um, I had a scrapbook. I had a, a document just called Summer. And over the space of about two years, I filled this document with little character ideas and sketches, and pieces of description and, and dialogue, just to kind of find my way into the mood of the novel. You know, people talk about the importance of, you know, this whole thing of whether you're a planner or what's that terrible word, pantser. And I do plan, but I don't, by plan, I don't mean working out the story beats. I mean, working out the tone of the thing and the mood of the thing and the, the effect that I want it to have on the reader and whether it's a first person voice or a third person voice, because they're massively different. And um, who all the characters are and uh, their biographical details and their, their tastes and their, their their clothes and it's it planning isn't just about um story beats it's about i think working out how you want the reader to feel and how to achieve that and so once i'd filled this document with about seventy thousand words i read through it having given a certain amount of time to sit and kind of marinate 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 um and went back to it and then I worked out what the plan of the novel would be. But yeah, there, there are all kinds of other more, not impressionistic, but more abstract notions that you have to uh, prepare before you can actually start writing the book. Um, but I've never improvised a book. And the times when I have tried to improvise a book have been wasted. You know, mm. I've always ended up throwing it away. Um, screenplays, I tend, I mean, it's hard because I, I because I have fiction as an outlet for my original stories and characters, most of my screenwriting has been adaptations. I haven't written this original screenplay since um, a, a thing I did called uh, The 739 for the BBC a few years ago, which was an original love story. So in a way, you don't need to plan in quite the same way because the plan is often the novel. Mm -hmm. You know, if you know the novel well enough and know what you're going to keep and what you're going to change, then you don't need to do quite the same in-depth preparation that I might do for an original screenplay, which I would tend to storyline before I wrote. And when you when you are adapting a book to a script, because um, you've done a lot of your own work and you've done other people's work, yeah, obviously it's a different art when what works for a book doesn't always work for a script and the same goes the other way. And how do you how do you approach that? How do you know what will work or how to change something to translate it for the screen? And is it the same if you're doing it for your own work as compared to doing it for someone else's work? Uh, that's a really interesting question. And I could use the whole of the rest of the time to talk about this. <laughs> I don't want to get too boring about it. I mean, I, perhaps it's best to give you an example. Um, when we adapted Start of a Ten, my first novel for the screen. You know, Start of a Ten was a first person novel and that's incredibly hard to adapt because you're going to lose all of the jokes that are in his head. Mm -hmm. And we don't say every funny thing we think of out loud. Uh, uh, you can't, a screenplay can't be full of, you know, amusing observations and descriptions. It's got to be dialogue. So the first thing you have to know is you're going to, you, you're really going to be taking the most of what you're going to take is the dialogue if the dialogue works and everything that you're going to lose is description metaphor simile interior monologue all of that there was a big set piece in start of the 10 where he goes to a tarts and vickers party on the first day of university and gets drunk and dances tries to seduce this girl he fancies through his dancing and uh and people when they read the novel they used to remark on that chapter and it was as a highlight and so of mm -hmm. course we're going to put it in the film 
and we rehearsed it and got a choreographer in and James McAvoy was playing the, the part and he did this brilliantly funny dance and we thought it was going to be great you know classic awful dancing at a student party and when we watched them the edit it was deathly it was just awful it just wasn't funny at all and everyone just kind of looked at each other and <laughs> we knew we had to cut it mm-hmm. it had to go and the reason is because because in the novel he thought he was dancing well yeah and on screen he's just dancing badly there's no there's no mismatch I mean, he's acting someone who's dancing in a cocky way, but that doesn't make it any funnier. Whereas in the novel, his self-satisfaction was uh, uh, juxtaposed against what you could tell the audience, were, the, the people around him at the party were thinking. So often, if something is too reliant on an inner monologue, you have to cut it. You just have to lose it. And another difficulty when you adapt your work is not everyone has a confidant. You know, this is why best there are so many best friends on film. Yeah. Uh, And so few in novels, because on film you need a best friend and you need someone to confide in because it's the only way in the script to get these honest interior thoughts out, expressed. Whereas in a novel, you just tell the reader, you just tell the reader what the character thinks. And it's very straightforward. you can do that in first person or third person, it doesn't matter, you just say. And so um, uh, that is, I've, I told you I could waffle on, I've lost track of the original question, but that is the <laughs> biggest challenge, is the loss of everything that exists purely in, in, a, in a prose form. So again, you know, the, the, my last um, novel, Sweet Sorrow, there's a school disco sequence that's, on the page is a big comic set piece because it's full of, you know, funny similes and metaphors and observations. And on screen, I bet it will last maybe 45 seconds mm-hmm. because there's nothing in it that isn't in the prose. And um, it's very easy, for instance, in a character, uh, it's very easy in a novel for a character to say, I remember when I was nine years old, blah, blah, blah. And when you get to that passage and you're adapting it, you think, well, we're not going to flash back to when he was nine years old. We can't do that. <laughs> you know, we're just going to have to cut it. Just yeah. forget it. Just, just move on. Find out what you love about the story and the characters and put that on the screen. Yeah. And everything you love in the prose uh, and in the authorial tone and in the descriptions, that will still exist because it's a book. Yeah. You know, they don't take the books away when the film gets made. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to make, um, just hold on to what you love about the original. And that's, I suppose, why I've always tried to adapt quite faithfully uh, in that I want to kind of distill the essence of of the book's story and characters, even if I'm going to lose the, the book's wonderful prose. Yeah. There's a, I think Oz is one of the few books that I've read that made me kind of laugh as I was reading it out loud. And um, there's a scene in Us, I can't remember the exact way it works, but he basically says something out loud as at the exact same time he's thinking, don't say that. And it's a, it's a really kind of, it's a really funny moment. And it's a it's kind of moment that would only work in a book. You know, how you be really hard to do that in a film yeah. without having an inner monologue running, which you can yeah. do and, and works fine, but it's, it's, it, it feels very, very differently. So I can see that, that problem and trying to adapt stuff for sure well yeah us, us was really difficult because you know it's about i mean the, the, the main characteristic of of douglas is that his intentions don't match up to his actions and the love he feels for his son and his wife isn't expressed in his words or behavior mm-hmm. so how are you going to put that on screen well what you're going to have to do is employ an amazing actor Mm-hmm. who will give you the 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 inner monologue behind the eyes yeah exactly that, that, he, exactly. that he says something and immediately regrets it and yeah, it doesn't yeah. you know it doesn't overact regret but you can tell that the, the characters um uh desires aren't the same as uh his actions and and so yeah it it was a very tricky one to ask because it's a first person a novel with someone who doesn't speak honestly or directly <laughs> Um, and, and we were very, very lucky to have brilliant actors who can tell the other story. Um, but it also is different. You know, it, it, it is the, the jokes come from another place. 
Douglas is quite witty in the no, in the novel, in that his observations about the world are very astute. Um, on screen, the comedy isn't going to come from Douglas's wit; it's going to come from his behaviour and his foolishness, and that's fine. Again, if you have an actor who can give you a humanity and warmth, and uh, uh, that 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 over overcomes the the rotten things that he says and does. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's why I'm a big fan of, that's why also I love screenwriting because it does let you work with these amazing people, yeah. actors. And and is adapting, do you find it any easier or different if you, whether it's your own work or someone else's? I mean, is, there a, is it easier when it's someone else's work because you don't have that close attachment yeah. to it? It is a little, it is a little easier. I, I, I'm I'm pretty free and easy with my own novels. You know, I don't I don't agonize about throwing things away because I know because I was a screenwriter before I was a novelist. Mm-hmm. So I I know how you know tough and ruthless it can be, and you you, you know, how 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 um, uh, how roughly the material can be treated, um, and I don't mind. You know, it, it, us is pretty different from the novel in lots of ways. I mean, for a start, there are many more locations in the novel because locations in the novel don't cost anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, whereas on set, on screen, I always knew we were going to have to cut it down to three or four cities. In the novel, it's nine. Um, also, in flashbacks, uh, again, in the novel, you can very easily say, uh, zoom around through time schemes. In, in um in an adaptation, you have to decide whether we're going to have one actor that we age up and down, or are we going to have more than one actor? And if we do so, then what's the cutoff point? At what point does this face change from A to B? Because you can't cross fade uh, once you cast. Um, so uh, I was pretty, you know, free and easy with the novel, and, and there's lots that's missing. Um, with other people's writing, I I don't know. I, I try. Uh, I don't know the story behind the writing. That's the other thing to say. Is that often, even if a novel is an autobiographical, you remember the act of writing it, and so it's it is hard to say goodbye to things. And also, you you don't necessarily you're not objective. Whereas there is a certain objectivity when you adapt someone else's work, and you can you don't know what's gone into the writing. You don't know the real life version of a character. So on something like um, Patrick Melrose, uh, I, I conflated two or three um, characters in the novels over the course of uh, five novels, because when Edward St. Alban wrote the novels, he didn't know they were going to be adapted, and you know he he wrote them over a long period of time, and I, in a way, am going back and economizing. You know, I'm making the mm-hmm. kind of decisions that hopefully. Edward would recognise as wise if he were writing them as scripts rather than as as novels over the course of twenty five years. So um, there's a, a, a particularly female character who, really, in the novels, there's four or five other characters. Now that's easier for me to do than uh, than it would be for Edward, I imagine, because he knows where those characters came from, and I'm blissfully ignorant of that. So you can be a little bit more free and easy. However, I'm not one of those dramatists who reads a book once and throws it across the room and writes their own version. You know, I, <laughs> I, I won't adapt something unless I love it. Yeah. And and the very first stage of the process for me is to learn it. You know, is to is to listen to it on audiobook, to read it over and over again, to annotate every page until I, I I'm pretty until I feel I could go on mastermind and answer questions on it. And then of course I'll have to throw things out, but I would try and retain what I love about it. Mm-hmm. And um, do you enjoy this kind of going going back and forth between books and films? You know, you, you seem to bounce around at, at, at the moment. Is yeah. that something you quite enjoy? I do. I do. I tell you what I feel, though. I don't know if this is too candid. It, I really, really love cinema. And I've done um, six films now. And I, I, I never... They're very, very eclectic. And... I wish they weren't in a way. I wish that it was a kind of my primary form because I really, really love film. And I think in film, you really only get a wonderful result if you're very, very simpatico with a director. And though I've enjoyed 
working with all of the directors I've worked with, I've never quite found a voice in cinema. Uh, I think on, on TV, maybe I've got a little bit closer to it, but but there's nothing, you know, there's very little in common between Tess, you know, which I did for the BBC and us. Mm -hmm. They're very, very different. Or Melrose and us, you know, the most two most recent. But maybe they do share something. Maybe there is a kind of quality in there that that is sort of my voice. On film, I've never really found that. And I think it's maybe because I, I've never, you know, I love old Hollywood and I've never quite had that kind of Billy Wilder, I.L. Diamond kind of rapport with a director. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I love it, but I don't think I've cracked film and I'd love to write a really great film. Uh, and, you know, that's that's the kind of, if I did have an ambition, it would be that, to write a real crowd-pleasing but smart movie. I don't know if that'll ever happen now. Uh, I, I think, I think some people would say you already have. I have to say. <laughs> well, thank you, but uh, it's nice. But I, I, I'm I'm proud of them all. But I I feel like they, you know, either they were books first, or mm. or you know, then or the six the, the the good things about them aren't for me. Um, I mean, I think I could say that about Melrose too. Uh, you know, there if there is an achievement with that series, and it's it's the piece of work on screen that I'm proudest of. I think it's it's. The, the brilliance of the original novels and you know I, I I'm, I'm 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 not being meek about my contribution i think technically it was a good piece of adaptation but i couldn't have told if you know if you told me to write the story myself i wouldn't have been able to do it you know mm -hmm. i was extremely reliant on amazing novels and and so what what is next if you got what are you working on just now if you're able to tell us uh, uh yeah there's one that i'm not able to tell you about which i which i'm enjoying very much but i have to i have to keep quiet about um and the other thing i'm doing is is my last novel sweet sorrow um you know which um i have taken a lot of liberties with because again the the novel has a kind of um a framing device and a, and a, um, you know, it's a memory novel. It was always meant to be said in the nineties, but told from a, an adult's point of view now and someone looking back. And that's very, very hard to do on screen. Mm -hmm. So I've just taken the memory and I'm trying to write a, 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 a what I hope will be a, a touching, funny coming of age summer love story set in 97 Excellent. against the background of this, um, you know, someone who is against his will forced to take part in an amateur production of Romeo and Juliet. And that's, um, it's sort of Gregory's Girl meets Breaking Away meets The 400 Blows. You know, it's a kind of, it's all my favourite coming of age stories mm -hmm. blended. And um, I'm writing that at the moment. And uh, I just got my notes, which were very good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and you know we'll see. Excellent. Yes. Look forward to. It. Uh, but I was, you know, I was going to write. I was going to write a, no a, a, a novel or a novella. You know, it was time to sit down and, and and try and work out what I wanted to say in in fiction. And I just couldn't find anything um, uh, urgent enough, or, or anything that would work in a contemporary world while all of this is going on. Yeah. So I I've taken a deep breath and put prose. Uh, fiction to, to one side um, for a while but towards the end of the year I'll, I, if, if, if life becomes you know I really don't want to write about any of this mm. pandemic mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing to write about I don't think someone will write something brilliant about it but it won't be me um, but I, I will have to start thinking about the novel again because as I say you know I, I love both but um you're in charge with fiction and, and if it works it's you and if it fails it's you uh screenplay is it's it's a real privilege to make things but it's uh, such a stressful process yeah. i mean i can't say how heart-clenchingly um frustrating and difficult and confrontational and, and you know and frightening it can be um so I hope I can always do it, and at the same time, it really does scare the hell out of me uh, because so much is at stake. Um, so I, I, I do. Uh, I, I 
I hope to do it again more than once, but um, it's it's frightening. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we look forward to Sweet Sorrow whenever whenever that arrives on the stage, definitely. <laughs> What is the last book that you read? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, and of course, does, does everyone always forget? Yes, yes. they always do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always edit this bit down. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Why do we do that? Uh, look, I have it here. I'm reading it at the moment. It's a, it's a novel called We Are, um, we Are Not in the World by Conor O'Callaghan, who's a, who is an Irish poet and novelist. And it's, it's I'm about halfway through it. It's very beautiful. It's a, it's a very tough story, but told in very exquisite poetic prose. Um, has a lovely kind of yearning melancholy to it about um, fathers and daughters, uh, which is a relationship I've never really written about. So um, I'm, I'm reading around it. Uh, and so I'm reading that currently, and it's uh, it's very beautiful. Excellent. Nice. And uh, what about the last film that you watched? Um uh, oh, I can I can answer this one. Um, uh, a really lovely film that I saw about ten years ago and wanted to see again called "I Know Where I'm Going," which is a Powell and Pressburger All right. film, lesser known Powell and Pressburger movie from um, the forties, but uh, a really beautiful film. I think a, a very classic romantic comedy premise, um, but. Stunning photography, uh, that eccentric, quirky atmosphere that Powell and Bresberger have, and and uh, a, a really funny, touching, um, exquisite uh, romantic comedy in black and white. Excellent. And uh, what was the last TV show that you watched or are watching? Oh, we're watching um, uh, Adam Curtis at the moment. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and, uh, you know, which I which I love and uh, don't always follow, uh, but I'm watching it with my son, who who's kind of uh, who's never you know never really heard about the Vietnam War and the Bolshevik Revolution and, <laughs> and Lee Harvey Oswald and all of this. So it's a kind of whirlwind tour of, of conspiracies and paranoia and anxiety. <laughs> and we, every night it ends, and we're all completely shaken and horrified by uh history and society and so and we'll go and have anxious nights but it's um it's very brilliantly done as well yeah i do love his stuff i've, I've still yeah. i've got to start that one but uh, yeah oh it's great but it is very very dispiriting yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not good time uh lockdown viewing <laughs> And uh, the very, very last thing that we do is a quick fire, either or, and uh, there's no right answers okay. um, apart from one, perhaps. Um, okay. So the first one is is Bamber Gascoigne or Jeremy Paxman? I think I'm a Bamber loyalist. Yeah, Bamber, I have to say. I hope Jeremy doesn't listen. <laughs> um, US TV or UK TV? Oh, I think I'd have to say UK TV. Yeah, I think we get a slightly distorted impression of US TV because we see the five best shows. Yeah. That's UK probably TV. true, actually, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. UK TV. Um, eat in or go out? At the moment, go out. I can't bear the taste of my own food. It's something <laughs> crazy. <laughs> I can taste it now. It's the same every night. <laughs> I definitely go out. Uh, TV or cinema? Oh, well, this is a hard one. I think my first love is probably, well, f to be honest, films on TV. Right. But I think film um, film would be my answer, yeah. Okay. I didn't really go to, the, we didn't have a cinema where I grew up, uh, but uh, watching a movie on television was a big deal for me. And uh, last one, real book or ebook? Oh, uh, again, real book, yeah. <laughs> I, I I do read ebooks, but the, 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 it's sort of my attention sort of skitters across the surface. I don't necessarily take it in in the same way. But um, 
That's fair. Uh, real books. Yeah. As long as you're not one of those people who seem to like the smell of the books, it seems to be a <laughs> thing that a lot of people have, which I don't quite understand. No, people do. People do fetishize them, don't they, in a, in a kind of sentimental way. But now I'm, I, 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 you know, I turn corners and I scribble in them and everything, and um, but I do feel very attached to them as well. Very interesting to hear that Daniel Radcliffe's dad was his was his agent for a brief period of time. Yeah, until obviously very brief period of time until Harry Potter came along and <laughs> yeah. and changed. I can't be your agent that. anymore. My son's making too much money for me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. The, that's the real you, dream, isn't it? You deal with your own writing. I've got <laughs> I've got more important things to do. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, th- I thought that was a really uh, interesting chat with with David and. Just hearing what he was saying about the differences between novel writing and screenwriting, yeah, uh, and how the 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 bluntness that you have in that screenwriting world can be quite difficult sometimes to deal with. You know, you'll always get editors' notes if you're an author, um, but it's it's that's I imagine more of a conversation between you and the editor or whatever, and it's it's never going to have that bluntness that he was saying that he sort of dreads when you're going through the page by page turns of the screenplay yeah. and people are saying this just doesn't work or this is rubbish it you is, know i can see that's quite disheartening you know totally and 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 he i mean like many people we've chatted with who have straddled both the novel and the tv film world you know you can be a writer in both worlds but they're very different worlds mm-hmm. and as you say on, on on one side on the novel it's it's you and your editor or whatever and on the other side it's you and 20 people and if yeah. you're in a writer's room it's even more people and it, it sounds like a total a much more stressful situation and a much more you have to have a much thicker skin in the I, film writing world I, I think that's right because i think you know if you're starting out writing if you want to tell stories initially i imagine the thought is there isn't much difference between you know it depends on the story maybe is this story yeah. more a cinematic idea or or a more visual idea or is it more a novel idea but it's not just the crafting of the the story that is wildly different but also what happens after you've crafted it is is yeah. wildly different as well. Um, Absolutely. Which I suppose is why, although a lot of people do have a crack at trying to do both, very few are actually successful in both fields. Totally, because I think it's, it's. Uh, I mean, and again, I'm sure this is something we've talked about in, in the past, but it's, it's a very different um, style. You know, one... In a novel, you've got a lot of crutches almost. You can you can just tell the reader what someone's thinking. It, it, you yeah, what, what he was saying about the inner monologue type exactly. idea. Yeah. That how do you translate these things and onto screen can be quite difficult. Yeah. Or how do you get across someone's my uncle and this is yeah you know without saying hello niece. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, yeah there, there's definitely a skill to that 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 perhaps isn't always appreciated. I think so. Um, um, and you know that I suppose is why some award ceremonies recognise the the adapted screenplay yeah, because absolutely. it is that being able to adapt, you know, a great work of literature into a film can be quite a difficult task. Um, but uh, thanks very much to David for uh, taking the time to come onto the podcast. Uh, really enjoyed that chat, as we say. And yeah, it was um, a lot of fun. Obviously, all of his books are available, and uh, it was exciting to hear that he's he's working on films as well and i know he said his his dream is still to write a really great film but as i said in the podcast there and i hope i wasn't it wasn't coming across as sycophantic i think some people <laughs> would say, you say yeah. yeah that he has already done that but i think he was meaning sort of a, an original story that wasn't a book first even his own book um you know it, coming up with a with an original screenplay is is what he's aiming to do and i'm sure he will do that oh, at some without point. Without a doubt, yeah. I, yeah I'm, I'm very excited for his, for his next book, Stroke Film, for sure. Well, as I say, thanks to David for coming on to the podcast, but we've got another uh, exciting guest next week. We do indeed. Uh, next week, we're chatting with Nikki Smith, who her debut novel was All in Her Head. Uh, that's the name of the book. It wasn't just a made-up book that she <laughs> thought about one day. <laughs> and that came out in uh, April 2020. And her latest book is Look What You Made Me Do, which uh, came which is- out just... Last yeah, month, yeah, I think that's right. Just last month, and yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting chat with Nikki because, you know, like a lot of people, she 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 had this dream of being a writer, but then went into a career in I think it's finance in 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 her case, and came back to writing a bit later on and 
sort of said, no, this is actually what I want to do and took a chance. I think she did the Curtis Brown creative writing course. That's right, yeah. And it, that drew her back into writing. So, you know, it's... It, I, I, as as someone who's done who's followed that path of going into a completely different career, I'm always encouraged to hear about people that are able to, you know, sort of redirect themselves back towards writing again. Yeah, and and again, she's someone who has done one of these, the Curtis Brown creative mm-hmm. writing courses, and you know, there's many courses like that out there. And we've chatted to, to a few, and yeah, and it's, it's it does seem to be something that a lot of people really recommend. So we we chat about that again with with yeah that course. that particular course keeps getting brought, doesn't it? It does. It so, pops up again and again. Yeah. So it's definitely one worth considering. But yeah, we chat to her about that in in more detail next week. So please do tune in for that one. Before we go, I will ask that if you enjoyed the episode please do take the time to uh, leave a rating and review for us on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app uh, you're using. And do check out the back catalogue if this is your first episode. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button, and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UKPage1, as evidenced here and our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.